Welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello and welcome to a very special episode on the Music Ed Matters podcast, crossing over to Choralosophy podcast because Chris Muntz is the bomb and I love the Choralosophy podcast. And if you're not listening to the Choralosophy podcast, you should totally go subscribe. Chris is an amazing host having some really important conversations. But this conversation today is being recorded as a special bonus because in Savannah, Georgia, where I reside, St. Patrick's Day is a really big deal. So here comes a little bit of a extra blessing for you on St. Patrick's Day with this conversation between myself and Chris Muntz. We talk about him coming to the Southern Region ACDA Conference. And through that conversation, we talk about Enneagrams and understanding individual motivations and how that taints our world as conductors, educators, choir people. We talk about why we love these conferences and what we got out of the conferences and just so much more. My favorite part of talking to Chris is just how easy it is to have conversation. And it's a great reminder that this platform exists for that reason to have the conversations and to go deep in thought and get past the surface level stuff and really figure out things that we as a choral community need to think about and grow about together. So this is my friend, Chris Muntz from the Choralosophy podcast, as we become better conversation advocates and talk about all sorts of things. I hope you enjoy. As always, the Music Ed Matter podcast is brought to you by our friends at Kaleidoscope Adventures and the Kinnison Choral Company. I know that Chris has a ton of amazing sponsors that you should check out as well. And a big plug, if you want to work with Chris and or myself, he has a summer program for middle school, high school, college, pre-professional singers, and his professional choir in Kansas City. It's called Cantorai. It's a summer festival. I put all the information in the episode notes, but you should totally check it out. You have until about May 15th to sign up, and it would be a blast to make music with young people in Kansas City with myself and Chris Mons. Anyway, enough of the announcements. Let's get into this conversation as we become better conversation advocates. Today on the Music Ed Matters podcast and the Choralosophy podcast, we have returning guest, Chris Muntz. How's it going, Chris? It's going great, Amy. How are you? I'm so excited to have a conversation with you. You are one of my favorite people to talk to. Talking has become comfortable for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're really good at it. And we got to actually be in person and have in-person conversations for multiple days in a row last month. That was so much fun. It was so much fun. Thank you for coming to Southern Region ACDA. It, yes, it was it was great. I um, I'll I'll share. You already know this, but for people listening, the reason I was there uh, was really just that it was the dates that worked on my calendar. I, I I wish I could tell you I chose Southern ACDA because I knew something special about Southern ACDA, but I didn't. Uh, I do now, but I didn't. It was really just that I looked at all the regionals, and it was the one that I could get away for three days. Okay, what um, region would you normally be in? Southwest. Okay, for people listening that don't know the ACDA, American Coral Directors Association structure, all 50 states are organized into six or seven regions. Southern has 11 states. How many does yours have? Oh my goodness, I don't know. Uh, eight or nine, maybe? Okay, cool. Sounds right. Of course, Texas counts as like four. Right. So. <laughs> they do their own thing anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but all of the states come together on even years. And then on odd years, we have national conventions. And so right. it is. it was an extra treat when you said you were getting to go to Southern because that meant I got to see you in person. Yeah. Yeah. That was so much fun. And, uh, you know, for me, I, I've only been to Southwest, my own home region. And I've been to national a few times, but it's always difficult for me at that time of year because I teach high school and that's festival time. Like that's the time of the year of all of our evaluative events. I'm not a big fan of music for a score. Anyway, we, you know, there's some valuable things about it. And so getting away for that, from that time of year is a challenge. So it really just needed to be the, those exact dates. And so I'm glad it worked, I'm, I'm glad it worked out. Yeah. Did you drive over to Raleigh? 
No, no, I flew. Okay, you flew. How? So you flew in. I flew in. Remember, I mean, my flight got canceled. Oh yeah, home. that's right. Your flight got canceled. We got bonus night. That that was extra <laughs> awesome. We can talk about yeah. that at the end. I do remember that. So when you were making the decision for Southern, what did you? What were you looking at? Were you just simply the dates? You didn't have any idea about anything else. It was just the dates. Okay, and you got. I, I just knew else. I needed. I wanted to go to something. Okay. Okay, so we know that there is value in going to something. I've yes. also never been to a regional not Southern. I've been to tons of nationals, right. but I've never not been to a Southern region. I've seen pictures. Yeah. There's one happening right now. Oh, or, Northwest, I think. Is it? Yeah, maybe. Is that right? They're the I, last one, I think. Maybe. Some someplace, Long Beach, maybe? Maybe that uh, was last week. Well, I think Western art has already happened. Oh, well, there's lots of them to choose from. Yes. And you managed Southern because you had your adjudicated festival right. that got canceled. That ended up being canceled anyway. <laughs> we'll talk yes. about that too. I could, had I known, I could have gone to all the regionals. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, true. Who needs to teach? Who yeah, needs to teach? Just go get filled up. Okay, so you pick Southern, <laughs> you get your flights. I know we were talking back and forth hotels and stuff, and we ended up being in similar hotels. Tell me about your experience coming to Southern in comparison to going to your home conference. Well, you know, that's that's hard for me to answer. It's almost like asking, um, uh, you know, asking a fish what the water feels like because I, I had never been to any other, and so there was no frame of reference for me to, to compare. And so here's the best way I could, because you, you were going to ask me this and I've been thinking about it. Uh, the, the thing that I would just describe is how it personally was different for me. Uh, which is that I didn't know anyone there. And so there is a certain amount there of the, that's both good and bad in the sense that you don't know anyone there. And so you're not really sure from, I wasn't sure from minute to minute who I was going to hang out with, if I was going to be by myself, if I was gonna, what I was going to go to. Um, because you, you, when you're in your home region, uh, you have your little local click people. Um, I think now that I'm my perspective on this has changed too since I've started podcasting because I I know people, quote unquote, but I don't really from everywhere. Um, in other words, I know of you, I know of a person, and I might have even had several interactions with that person, but I don't really know them. Whereas when I'm in my home uh, network, I might have people that I've known since I was in undergrad. Um, and, and there's that baggage, but also that familiarity. And so the thing that I enjoyed the most at first, right off the bat is, is that I, um, well, this is maybe TMI for you and your audience, but I, I'm not great in social situations normally. Um, and, and I, I don't feel comfortable in social situations. I can fake it. Uh, but I'm not super comfortable in those situations. And I, the thing I enjoyed the most is I was able to go to, to Southern without putting any type of expectations on myself for meeting people, because I was like, I don't know anybody anyway. I get to just be be open to whatever happens. Uh, whereas when you're around other people that you already know, uh, there's like, well, there's that one time I tried to talk to that person and it didn't go well, <laughs> or, or whatever, you bring all that. And so I, I felt like, uh, I don't know, it's like almost a chance to go and just meet people with a clean slate. You had a, an anonymous factor. You could, you didn't have to be anywhere. You didn't have to have a full lunch and dinner schedule. You could just show up and be you and mm -hmm. remove some of those barriers. Get, yeah. Rewind for a second. So yeah. I have a student who, in, we just did midterm reflections. And my student said, I really am struggling with some of the interaction stuff in class because I'm so introverted. I'm trying and I'm improving. Can you help shine a light on that for me? Because you are an amazing podcaster. But yet you said the social situation thing is not your favorite. Talk me through that a little bit. Well, so um, I didn't know you were going to therapize me. I mean, Sorry, I'm so extroverted. No, I don't understand. No, it's good. It's, I'm, no, I'm glad. I'm, uh, I'm glad. So um, here's the best way I would explain that. Um, I suck at small talk, mm. which is one of the reasons I'm a good podcaster. I, I can talk. And I, I will have a conversation with you, even in a social setting, even if I've never met you before, but I'm going to want to skip really quickly to the, like your life story and like, what makes you, you, and maybe even talk if I feel like the person is nerdy enough, I want to go right to like, what philosophers have you read and what has influenced your opinion about this, this, and this, and I'll go right to, um, politics. I don't care. I'll go right to religion. I'll go to sexuality. 
I'll talk about any of those things with anyone, but the thing that that I uh, that I fear the most in social settings is small talk because I don't mm-hmm. feel like I'm good at it. And so I think one of the things that uh, causes that to be an anxiety producing situation for me is that since I I feel disinterested in the small talk, that will come across to people sometimes as well. He's just not interested in me, and therefore mm-hmm. he's an asshole. Or whatever. I don't know if you blurp out words on your show, but yeah. um, okay. So, so that the, and that's a false perception because I don't think of it that way. I, I actually think of it like, no, I want to get to know the real you. If I'm, if I'm, if I've got ten minutes to talk with someone, I would rather it not be about the weather. Mm. Um, you know that that's kind of how I see it. And so, learning that about myself has been helpful, uh, and it, it's also why it might lead you you to ask that question, which is on a podcast. Uh, I seem so comfortable talking. Well, because I know that on a podcast, we get to turn on the microphones and go straight to the good stuff. <laughs> right. You know, we don't have to sit there and like talk about, you know, although we did talk about my snowy weather in Kansas City, but it's topical, um, it, you know, that kind of thing. And I think for for the the student that you have too, and this is, you asked a question about a student who brought up the, this, uh, this topic for themselves as a teacher. I had to go through that too. Um, I, in fact, it's way easier for me to be open and vulnerable and social with my students than it is with adults that I meet because, because I've had time. I, I think it, for me, it just takes time uh, because I, I also have to recognize that other people actually might need the small talk. Ah. Like, you know, um, <clears throat> they might need to t- tiptoe in the waters to see if you're safe before they <laughs> yeah. before they're willing to go to the, the heavy stuff. And so with my students at school, you have that time. You have those icebreaker activities. You have those maybe even years. If, as a high school teacher, I might have a kid for four years. Well, there's no icebreaker needed after three or four years. You really know each other. Right. Uh, and so I think that's that, that's probably what the best advice I would give to your student is, is that uh, don't worry about being an introvert it, as a teacher because you're, that's an investment of time that will pay off and in, in, in the comfort level will be there eventually. I love that, an investment of time. But I also get that on the flip side for me. I, ha- I have to take a step back and not come on too strong. We just I just started a mini master for one of the general music classes I teach at a small university here in Savannah. And I meet with all the students the first week because I realize – they're watching me in lectures and that's a lot to take in in a one hour video recorded lecture. So I require a first week virtual one-on-one meeting. So they're, they realize this is a real human being and I all like I know I'm a lot to handle and some of their eyeballs are bigger than silver dollars when they first meet me. But by the end, it's opened up the gate for conversation. And I think what to your note, getting to know yourself and how to build that rapport and those intentional relationships. Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, uh, to, turning it around to you now, because you say, you know, you're a lot to handle. Okay. That's, that's true. But I'd, in, for somebody like me, that's probably why I like you. Oh, you're easy to talk to. Well, yeah, but I, but you make me easier to talk to in, in person, especially because but somebody like me, I need someone else to start yapping because then that, that tells me, okay, it's, it's okay now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and my, my wife, Beth is a very similar, so, so I always make, um, I make this comment to her all the time and she's been trying to convince me that I, I can be in social situations where she's not there, yes. um, to like the conversation going, uh, so that I can, I feel comfortable and safe to, to be a part of it. Uh, because at the same time, I also know this is, this is where it gets tricky for me because I also know that once I get started talking again, being a podcaster, I will just keep talking because I'm fascinated by the conversation. Um, and, and so, so for me, it, I have to, I'm always like, you know, the little devils on your shoulder, like the little white, uh, dress yeah, devil the and the devil. little black. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so I've always got the little, the, the little devil on my shoulder who's telling me, well, don't talk, don't, t- don't dominate the conversation. Don't dominate the conversation. Don't dominate the conversation. And so then I'll just not talk. And so, so then, <laughs> so then it goes back to like, oh, that guy, he just doesn't care. He, he doesn't, he's just too good. So I, 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 my struggle is figuring out the right 
balance in those types of social situations, which is, again, if taking it back to the choir classroom, mm -hmm. great, because, uh, you know, we just sing most of the time. And you don't <laughs> have takes, to worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. And if people listening haven't seen Chris in action in the high school choral setting, I have all my students watch YouTube videos of his class because it's so fast paced and such an excellent example of a high school teacher in the trenches. I'll make sure to link some of my favorite YouTubes of your classroom in the episode mm -hmm. notes because they're so good. But, you know, going back to you coming to Southern, it was really fun to bring you along and introduce you to everybody and their mother. I was so, I was like, I was like the best friend. Have you guys met Chris? Like everywhere we went, I was so excited to introduce you. Well, and I appreciated that because that, you know, I, like I said, I didn't know anybody there. And so it would have been difficult for me to just go up and say hi mm. um, because I'm not Emmy. Um, and so that is having uh, having you there to to lubricate that wheel <laughs> was was very helpful. Well, it was definitely fun. And something that happened in one of those conversations, I really stuck with me. I told you before we started that there was one thing in particular that you said, and you you did a whole bunch of stuff on the enneagrams. And if you're listening to the podcast and you haven't heard Chris's stuff on the enneagrams, go look back at some of those episodes. But you talked about how your like your enneagram is one way and then you know you're dealing with stuff when you're on that flip side could you explain that because that mm. was such a thought-provoking moment and i have been spending so much time working on that yeah that's a good uh, a good point so it, in fact i probably should do some more stuff on the enneagram soon because i right now i'm taking a class um through my school district on the Clifford strengths matrices. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of those, but it's like a mostly done with business businesses. They'll have their employees do it. Um, and so I've, I've really found value in these types of frameworks where you're being asked to reflect on your own strengths and weaknesses. And Enneagram has, is, has been one of the most impactful ones that I've ever looked into and I think for some people it's scary because the like the the logo image looks like a satanic symbol or something, and so they think it's some kind of religious thing, and it isn't at all. It's um, <clears throat> it's really based on some insights that are related to uh, the inner workings and the complexity uh, that that makes us all human, which is that it it, it would be reductive or uh, over simple to t say that well I'm I'm an extrovert or I'm an introvert. Well, that's not true about anybody. They, in certain situations, you're an introverted. In certain situations, you're extroverted. And so the, the and I don't have an image to, to share handy, but so in the Enneagram, it kind of looks like a nine-sided clock with lines connecting all of these numbers to help, and it kind of creates a star in the middle and all this kind of stuff. And what it's trying to illustrate through that image is that everybody's everything. Everybody is all nine of those characteristics. What is different, though, is that everybody's motivations for uh, displaying certain behaviors might be different depending on which of their of those types of the nine types they are more dominant. Um, so you might watch uh, two people, for example, exhibit the exact same behavior, but unless you know enough about that person, you wouldn't have any idea or any way to guess why they did that thing. Um, that because two different people might have done again the same behavior and done it for two different reasons because mm -hmm. of stimuli that you could never know about. That motivation and, factor is yeah. so impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, for example, something like Myers Briggs test or some of those other uh, personality tests, the Enneagram is not a personality test. It doesn't try to teach you what your personality type is, it tries to help you understand why you do the things you do. Uh, which I found very valuable because at, not only for myself, but then also as a teacher, I've read Enneagram types to my students. We've taught, done, I've done exercises with them in class on this. And again, it's for a choir. In fact, I did a whole uh, ACDA presentation for a couple different conventions last summer on, on this idea too, where um, you have uh, all your, these students in your room Right. And so if you can imagine that just I'm not a great mathematician, but if you can imagine how many connections there are between one number, possible connections between one number on the Enneagram and then all of the other nine and then going every direction. Mm -hmm. And then you start to multiply that by how many kids might be in your choir. And you start to think about the just astronomically large number 
of possible motivations for any behavior one of your students exhibits, and you start to understand how complicated classroom management really is. Mm-hmm. Because I need to know why that kid did that thing if I ever hope to, to help him not or her not do it again, especially if it's something not nice or whatever. So uh, I'm rambling now, but I'll get back to your original question, which is this idea. But that was, I think, the background of what Enneagram right. is, and so I think important. that's important. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you're, you're, I had brought to you uh, at the convention was talking about this idea in, in the Enneagram that when a person is uh, at ease – and when they are in their, I guess you could call it a low stress state, then they, their dominant number tends to be the thing that you know is about that person, the way they do things, the way they operate and why they operate that way. Um, and then their Enneagram also tends to reflect, have a reflection on the other side of the circle um, of traits and that a person might exhibit when they are in stress. Um, in, a, in a time of stress, whether it be um, a low, a low, low point for mental health. Uh, maybe some adverse situations are happening in their life, and there are certain things that they will fall back to when things are not going well. So anyway, I, I think that that uh, for me was really helpful because I, I know that one of the things that I struggle with, especially in work-related situations and even in in relationships, is that if I am stressed. Uh, I will steamroll people. Mm-hmm. And and the way I define that is that I become task focused. I, I only see the task and I see the solution, the problem that's attached to the task. And when I'm stressed about the task, I no longer see the people that are in my, in my sphere. I, it's like a, think of it like a tunnel vision. And when I'm not stressed, that I I'm, don't like that, that I, I'm able to, slow down and pause and, you know, those types of things and, and helping, helping me how to articulate that to the people in my life has been incredibly impactful because now I've given them tools that, and given them language to tell me when I'm that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and also in a way that's not threatening then to me, because it's not saying it, it changes the, the, it changes the conversation. It's not Chris, you're being an asshole again. It's Chris, you, you're stressed again and causing and, you, and you're, you're, you're steamrolling people. Mm-hmm. And, and it's all, and since it's Enneagrams all about motivation, uh, the, it takes away that, uh, almost like, um, puning your motives part that we tend to hurt each other's feelings with. No one, no one's accusing me of doing it because I'm trying to hurt their feelings, which is how it used to be, right? When I before I knew how to explain the people that are important to me, that that I didn't know how to explain that my behavior might look one way, but my motivation underneath the behavior is is still very much that I love you, I care for you, um, I, I I'm this way because I'm trying to solve the problem so you don't have to. Mm-hmm. Um the way that I think I'm showing love, but then I'm not able to, like, I'm not self-aware in that moment enough to know that I'm not showing love at all. Uh, but my motivation was anyway. And I think that that really is really important to me as a concept, because I believe that that has broader implications than just me. I think that has to do with how we talk to each other as colleagues, how we, mm-hmm. how we communicate with the larger world, uh, is to assume that there are probably some good intents happening underneath whatever horrible thing you think you're seeing. Right. Uh, is that there is probably someone that's in stress, probably someone who has experienced something that you couldn't know about unless you asked them. And, and that's been very, very influential for me in the, over the last couple of years. Well, it was very impactful when you said it, and I have gone and done some really good digging because – I also come across a certain way when I'm stressed. That is, I'm now learning to empower the people around me with what words to say to help re-rail the situation. But it takes those conversations and to loop it back to you being at ACDA Southern. It was so much fun to have these one-on-one conversations and to be able to invite you into people that I have known since I was 17, 18, 19 and throughout my entire professional career, and to hear the types of conversations that were happening, I feel like conversations and togetherness, for me, is the number one reason to go to a conference. What about mm-hmm. for you? Absolutely. And yeah, in fact, um, 
the the listeners of, of my show have heard me tell the story a couple of times, so I'll just do the short version. But that's essentially what you just said is why I started a show in the first place. Mm-hmm. Is I felt like, <clears throat> no, I'm old enough to remember a pre-social media time of a choral director, um, and the only reason that I would have known, you know, 20 years ago when I started. The only reason I would have known colleagues and what they think and what they believe and how they teach would have been from going to a convention. And the only reason I would have made friends with them is because we went to the bar after. Mm-hmm. And and then I've over the last few years, of course, I've noticed that that has shifted into being uh, you get to you find out who people are and what they do and think and believe because of social media, which of course is a tiny snapshot into that person, and it's a horrible representation of of the complexity, like I was saying before with the Enneagram and all the possible combinations of why that person might've typed that thing and hit send. Mm. We have no idea. Mm-mm. And so from a convention, you get, uh, you have that in person, that even the body language, the eye contact, the tone of voice, all that matters. <coughs> yeah, it's so important. And I, I love that. You, you told me that in the beginning when I first met you, you said, I started this podcast to continue those conversations we were having at the bars, in the evenings, after the conference all day. And Mm -hmm. this podcast started for similar reasons, but different. I got home from from a conference and realized that the students that I'm teaching will never get to meet every single one of these people that I know, and they need to know all these awesome people. And so for Mm -hmm. me, it became, how can we spotlight and create a space so that we can get to know people's ideas and things that matter to them? Yeah. It's about, I mean, especially with, th- with your work uh, with music ed students, that's, mm-hmm. that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you're creating these essentially PD capsules for, mm-hmm. for them, which is, which is awesome. But, but I want to go back to something because you talked about how you were looking into Enneagram stuff for yourself. What is, what is stressed out Emmy look like? If you're going to be, if you're going to be an a-hole to me, what does it look like? I'm a, I'm short, like I'm short with you and I will, um, I will come across, as my mother says, um, slightly aggressive and intense. And um, if flip that all the way on its head, if you have pushed me to the limit, I am going to come across as an absolute bimbo. Because oh, I am it's a bimbo. Yeah, I'm just my, so my. These are my mother's words. This is what she calls me. Okay. Um, she knows when I am past the point of stretch. So we're working on giving her some new language. But a lot of times, people will interpret my energy or my drive or something that I said as short or aggressive or too intense or again too much to handle. And that's not necessarily my intention. I just really love to get things done. And I genetically have a ton of energy. I have so much energy in my family timeline. They all do a lot Mm -hmm. of stuff and I can't help that. And I don't want to help that because that's me. Right. Yes. And I think that's another thing I actually really enjoy about Enneagram is it's, it's, um, there are of the nine traits, Mm -hmm. there aren't good ones Mm -mm. and there aren't bad ones. Mm -mm. They are just who we are. Right, they're just they're, traits. they're just who we are, and and ways to describe and understand and think about who we are, and it, so I think that yes, that one of the most dangerous things that we sometimes do is we we su- succumb to pressure mm-hmm. to try to be something that we're not, mm-hmm. and that leads to a whole bunch of other things, a, a whole bunch of other problems and toxicity and uh, resentment and you know all of those other types of things, and so so that's good. Do you have any like? Um, examples that you could share of, of like, what are some types of things that make you that way? I don't get very easily stressed. Um, if I That's don't feel either. like I can get something done, if it's, if I'm stressed on time, if I'm running out of time to do something, or if someone is treating me unfairly or someone is treating someone else unfairly, if I see what I feel is unfairness happening, I will say something. That's interesting. That's inter- now. Are you uh, are you a th- are you a three? Yeah. So I've taken. I finally after I saw you, you were like, "Don't take any of the short tests. You have to take a real test." So I uh-huh. took one of those tests that took like forty five minutes to get to the end, and mm-hmm. by the end, I was just over all the questions because I was tired of answering the mm-hmm. questions, and it put me at a three. But when I read the traits, I think I'm more like a seven. Well, the reason I the reason I guessed three 
is because you were describing certain things that you do when you're stressed. Hmm. And threes, uh, so I'm an eight, mm -hmm. which is the opposite end of the circle from a three. Ah. Um, and, uh, and so the, that, that idea of, um, s speaking up when you see something unjust happening mm -hmm. is very much part of an eight. Um, and so a three would make sense to me based on what I've read about, about Enneagram, that when you're f backed into a corner, mm -hmm. you're going to become an eight. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, whereas, uh, you know, the, the idea of injustice versus, um, you know, fairness and, you know, those types of things are very much part of that profile. Um, and so there, those, it's like trying to know, it's like your Jekyll and Jekyll and Mr. Hyde mm -hmm. kind of thing. It's like, where do you go when you feel that surge of adrenaline? Um, oh gosh, you know, and it's interesting because that you say that it happens when you're short on time. And I think that's true for almost everyone, mm -hmm. uh, because that's how it is for me too. When I feel like, um, especially at school, like if, if there is just not enough time to get the kids ready to do what they need to do, then I flip into that mode uh, where I can become short with people. I can become um, like if I don't solve this problem for everyone involved, then they won't have a good time. Mm -hmm. and, and, that's, and that's one of the, the things that stresses me out the most is that the experiences that I'm trying to create for people in my choirs right. won't be that experience that I know they deserve. Mm -hmm. and, and then my injustice triggers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a great way of saying it because that's mm -hmm. the problem. It's you get to a point where like I can get anything done I need to get done. That is just one of those traits I'm very proud of myself in. I'm disciplined. No one has to tell me to do it. No one has to set a schedule. I will just get it all done and I will enjoy all of it in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. But it's when the time is running out, especially if I don't have control over it, and if someone is doing something that I think is not right. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. fascinating. So fascinating. It's understandable. Well, that was definitely one of my favorite conversations, sitting there and talking about that and just being able to introduce you to so many different people. Let's um let's loop back. Yeah. What what type of things did you go to at Southern? And I really enjoyed listening to your Patreon only release about what you learned at Southern. But what were some of the sessions you went to, some of the concerts? Give us a little insight. So the concerts at every convention that I go to, the concerts are the thing that I, I'm, I'm really there for, right? You know, um, I, that's the thing I care about. We're all choir nerds and we just want to hear choirs sing. Um, the sessions, of course, are, are great too, especially at the bigger conventions like a regional or a national. Um, I, it's not directly an answer to your question, but I've started to feel as I've gotten old, um, some of my, the local conventions or the smaller conventions, I don't feel as much as pulled anymore to the, mm -hmm. the sessions because I feel like I've, oh, I've seen that exact session 18 times. Mm -hmm. I don't need to go see that again. I want to go see the choirs because that's always something new and innovative and different. So in a lot of ways, that's been the case. Of course, I did get to see uh, your panel session that you did, um, which was which was awesome, and uh, and that was a, a lot of fun. Of course, my good friend Maria was there with you on that uh, on that panel, and so getting to see uh, those types of conversations, which again you did a, a, a it was called "What Would You Do," mm -hmm. and it was putting certain types of questions out there for. Um, teaching of diverse students and all types of situations that you might find yourself in a classroom of just not not knowing for sure how to handle that situation, right? And so that was good because it, it kind of goes back to what I was thinking about before with the podcast idea, which is that we've just spent too much time, in my opinion, shouting solutions at each other on Facebook groups mm -hmm. for those types of things. Those are better conversations had in person mm -hmm. because it, it, because again you can raise your hand and say, Hey, I'm not, I just don't feel comfortable saying this, that, or the other thing or doing this. Um, how do you, how would you explain that to me so that I would feel comfortable? That's a hard thing to have. That's a hard thing to, to, to be vulnerable online. Um, but those types of presentations were, are really valuable at conventions. So that was really awesome. I was also able to go, uh, to see a session Aaron Plisco did, um, on repertoire for women's voices and for treble voices. Uh, she called it historical repertoire uh, because a lot of times I know at the high school level, this is something we struggle with a lot is finding good quality 
repertoire because a lot of high school programs, mine included, um, oftentimes our treble choirs are less advanced mm. than, than say our SATB ad, advanced is kind of like the pinnacle for a lot of programs. And so what that oftentimes means is the sopranos and altos and the younger grade levels get like music that's left over like mm. the, the, the afterthought repertoire. And so that was a really nice session that she just provided a ton of repertoire ideas and resources of places to go find uh, some quality stuff. Um, and so that was good. And then uh, also got to see um, a, a session on, I think I can't remember, I'm going to blank on the title of the session, but it was something along the lines of healing the racial divide. Mm -hmm. um, and that was um, a really good session as well. And just I get, for the same reason, it, it's just the conversations that are important, but are very, very difficult to have in uh, short form, low context, low resolution kind of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now that conventions are back, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that the, this is like really the value of, of that. And, and maybe... Um, as we get more used to these types of uh, conversations for what I call like the pandemic really cemented a lot of these bad habits that we have, which is to, we spent more time on Facebook groups over the last two years than ever in history of humanity. Um, and, and now that as these conventions come back, maybe what I remember from my younger years is maybe some really sensitive conversation happens in one of these sessions mm -hmm. and it continues to the bar. Because mm -hmm. I, and of course I'm. It doesn't have to be the bar. I don't want for people who don't or drink. Or, <laughs> yes, or I just want to be clear that people who don't drink can also talk to me at conventions. Um, <laughs> you don't have to bring alcohol, uh, but just that metaphorical bar, right? That right. that that idea that we could take that conversation out of the session, and hey, I didn't I didn't agree with your point, but I, I'm interested in in why you think that. Um, it could be an incredibly empower, a powerful framing for us as colleagues to, to move some of these conversations forward. So I thought that was really valuable. I, I put together the program book. That was my role for Southern Region this time was putting together the program book. And I really felt that the sessions were all dynamite topics, but there was so much more of a, instead of just a top down, this is the knowledge you need to know, it was much more here's the research, here's the conversation, let's make this applicable. It mm -hmm. seemed to me that was the biggest drive of the sessions. And the sessions were packed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was not, uh, that, what, that, what, and that's just more of a practical aspect. The one thing that I noticed was, uh, of all the conventions I've ever been to, <clears throat> this was the easiest to get to things. Mm. Just the proximity of hotel, mm -hmm. convention center across the street, performance hall, literally on the next block. Mm -hmm. It made it so that you didn't have to make as many difficult choices about what to miss. Connie Drasakis and her team did such a great job. She's the president and Jason Locker, her co-programming chair. And there was a whole team. And I remember when we went as a planning committee to Raleigh, it was just so user-friendly. And that's part of it, having to figure out where to go and what to do and what to give up if you have to walk a lot of places. Uh-huh. Yeah, the logistics great. of that are a huge mm -hmm. like that that's a huge part of why it's enjoyable sometimes or not um <clears throat> so yeah absolutely and then of course the concerts were amazing, amazing. um the hall the, the hall ended up being really nice um I, I i liked the acoustics in there you could hear everything that was going on um of course get to, getting to hear the aeolians i i was really um really impressed by uh eugene rogers's group as well mm -hmm. um that was really amazing like just uh, I, my jaw was released for like the first two songs. Mm -hmm. um, I've never heard the group before. And so it was just like, wow. Uh, so that was awesome. And then of course the school groups are great too. It's always great to hear um, the young kids doing what they do in the youth choirs and, you know, that kind of thing, because obviously at, if you know, I'm a big choir nerd for like all the fancy stuff, that's great, but we don't fancy stuff. Mm -hmm. in 20 years if if we don't have those kids being engaged and uh, having fire lit under them uh that, that choral music is cool mm -hmm. um because they're not going to put the work in so that we can have those professional ensembles that we heard right. in the evenings uh, that, that, that just so doesn't happen so right. that was it was cool to see that whole continuum 
I think there was a great representation from young people. I know my my um, choir came up and was part of the opening President's Night concert. So we were in rehearsals with a few other youth choirs. We were selected from an application process, yada, yada. You can read about that online. But I will never forget after the concert, my singers performed with all these different youth choirs. They were conducted by the composers or arrangers of the music, and they were all Southern composers or arrangers. And then they got to sing the Yubi Latte Deo by Dan Forrest, conducted by Bill uh, Young, Dr. Young. And I had a couple sophomore juniors come up and just, we loved, he was so engaging, the best conductor I've ever worked with. I have to sing with an orchestra again. They were so excited. Yeah. about singing with other people and an orchestra. And that's not something I can recreate anywhere. Mm-hmm. That has to be something they experience there. Yeah. Yeah, there's some uh, the, the resources available when we pull ourselves together for a convention make certain things possible that just wouldn't you know wouldn't otherwise be possible. Uh that's absolutely true. You know, I had a had an experience once directing uh, at a national convention, uh, the project Will Todd, uh, mm-hmm. that you know was a collaboration between us and Oxford Press and Will, and had that, had that not been an, for a national ACDA convention, there just would have been no reason to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, let me rephrase that: a reason. There's always a reason, right? But a a reason that makes it like okay, everybody's going to pool all resources. We had to pool pool up our resources. Oxford had to pull a ton of resources. ACDA had to put in resources in order to make something like that happen, you know? And so there's a certain amount of uh, just even the nuts and bolts of making music that a convention can provide that us mere mortals on our own in our community organizations and schools oftentimes can't. So it's it's a truly special, uh, you know, once every two years or once every, you know, every other year, whatever it is, uh, that it's worth getting there. Uh, mm-hmm. to experience certain th- musical mountaintops that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. I think you've also given us a great example that sometimes it doesn't work to go to your home region and it's okay to branch out and go to other regions. What are you walking away from this now? You said at the beginning, you came in, you didn't know anyone, you were able to kind of be anonymous and pick and choose where you went. Looking back, what are you taking away from coming to Southern? Well, what was interesting is, you know, I... <laughs> Socially, I could be blank slate, but I I wasn't anonymous. Uh, the, I, it was uh, just because of the podcast. I was recognized all over the place, and that sounds like like a brag, but it's not. I I don't mean it that way at all. It was amazingly ha- um, heartwarming mm-hmm. to have uh, be approached by so many people who simply wanted to say thank you for something that I, it, it's, it's weird and abstract and I know you'll understand and people listening will just have, if they, if you don't podcast, you'll just have to just trust have to us on your imagination <laughs> is that, you know, I do this in my house. Like I'm 15 feet from where I sleep and, uh, you know, and my kid, my daughter's bedroom is right over there. Um, you know, and so for me, it's abstract because I turn on my microphone and I talk about things that I'm interested in and I, put them on a website and I hit send. Mm -hmm. And, and yet for, for people that are listening, it, I kind of, I liken it to choral performance in some ways where I might publish an episode with no way to know how it might impact a particular person somewhere on some part of the planet. Mm -hmm. I have no way of knowing. All I can do is put something out that I find interesting and that I think someone else might find helpful, but to have people in real life, come up to me and express some type of gratitude for, uh, the help, the, um, the encouragement, the, whatever it is that they were able to get from me walking 15 feet from my bedroom and recording into a microphone. Um, that's, that's surreal. Um, and it's, it, again, during the pandemic, these are just things I, it, I didn't, I wasn't meeting anyone in real life. So mm-hmm. it was all abstract. It was all on the internet and have have that on the internet become real life uh, mm-hmm. was a huge takeaway for me because it was it reminded me why I'm doing this. I and, feel the same way. Yeah, it was yeah. I, and, the stories. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the stories were so great. Like the people that would come up and say, "I listen to you every Tuesday when I'm walking. Thank you for releasing your episode so early." 
Like that's not even something yeah. I, I didn't know. I wasn't really like, I'm glad I'm releasing it at the time. That was a haphazard. That's what time I wake up and will remember to post the post about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those things. Yep. Yep. Uh, it's, 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 it was, it was great. And I think the, the takeaway then for me is largely, um, is that I am going to try to go and branch out, like you said, branch out to other regions in the future. Um, I am not locked in in any way to go into my home region, uh, partly, and it's nothing against my home region. I, but I've you know, been there and done that. You know, a lot. I'm old. Like I said, I've been doing this for a long time. So I want to experience what culture is like in other areas of the profession. Um, and, and so that that was eye opening to me. And then also just getting a chance to meet people in person that I have not ever met before. Mm-hmm. I think that I did. I had underestimated how valuable that was. Well, I agree wholeheartedly. It was so much fun to be seeing a first Southern experience through your eyes. Yeah. And it just, it was refreshing and enjoyable and invigorating from someone that has never been outside a Southern region. <laughs> <laughs> well, and maybe, maybe what have, has to happen next is that you come to mind sometime. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. We and have to plan I can, that. Then I can introduce you around all the, I can, I can parade you around like a, <laughs> totally like an perfect. energetic puppy. I totally brought you everywhere. I'm like, Chris, we're going here next. I mean, we here, we're doing this. Chris, you're coming. Like, it was so much fun. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for letting me do my favorite thing on the planet, which is connect people. It's my favorite, yeah. favorite And you're good thing. at it. You're well, good at it. Thank you. Well, you yeah. are great at having conversations, and I will echo what so many of your listeners say. You do a great job of saying the things need to be said in a way that is clear and needs to be said and thought about. And I am so appreciative because I'm not able to be that direct. And I really appreciate you taking the time and thought to do that. Well, I appreciate you saying that. That's very nice. No, it's it's real. You're, we're real friends. I'm really glad. <laughs> and just for people listening, Chris and I are going to be together this summer. Tell us about tell them about the event in June. Yeah. So the Contouri Summer Choral Institute is. Um, a summer outreach, educational outreach program that my professional group, Contra IKC, hosts and presents every summer. Uh, the group itself is 12 or 13 years old-ish. Kind of depends on if you're counting pandemic years. Um, but uh, but the, the institute is about nine years old. And so we, about three or four years into starting the group, we thought, let's branch out and do some educational outreach. And it started, this is kind of funny, so it started with my former high school students, Facebook DMing me on a regular basis saying, Mr. Month, we miss choir and college is just not the same. We want to want to sing something with you. And so I created essentially a, a reunion choir. It was almost all my, my students. Um, and we did, since Contra I already existed, we put it under that umbrella and created an event. And nine years later, it has grown into being guest clinicians. Um, a lot of students that are not my students from all over the region, um, 150 students right before COVID. That was where we we're at, and now we're rebuilding it. It was we had to pull it way back. Well, we had to cancel a year. We had to pull it way back last year to social distance and you know all of that. So we did it last year with only 40 students, mm. um, and this year we're going to try to rebuild at another choir, which is what your job is Yay. when you come to to get our middle school kids back into the loop. And we have a high school group and a pre-professional group and then the professional group as well. And they all collaborate and they rehearse together and perform some on their own and they perform together and all kinds of things. It's lots of fun. So if someone listening wants to bring a middle schooler, a high schooler, or if we want to share out with the pre-professional group, what are some of the places they can go for info and who's invited? Anyone is invited. Um, it, it, and you, we do have people who come from outside of Kansas City. So if you are a young adult, for example, um, who is coming for, who wants to come and sing in the pre-professional group, like a, you're a college age student or young 25 year old or whatever it is that you want to do. And money is a, is a factor. Uh, we have volunteers who are oftentimes willing to just put people up in their house and they stay and they just drive back and forth to rehearsals. Uh, with kids, of course, if you're, if you, you'd want to be supervised, kind of like an ACDA on choir, you'd want to have parents who can stay in a hotel room with you or, or whatever, but anyone from anywhere can come. Um, and we, like I said, we have grades six through eight and we have high school and we have adult. And so the best way to do it is go to contraoutkc.com and that's the, you'll find your information there. 
Perfect. I'm really excited. I'm also pumped for all the Ethiopian food in Kansas City because you guys have a ton of good Ethiopian food. We do. We do. And <laughs> and lots of good food from lots of places. It's yes, great. very true. But we don't have Ethiopian <laughs> in Savannah. So I'm counting down the days for a really good Ethiopian feast. Plus just time with you and your family. Hey, Chris, thanks for giving up a Saturday to unpack Southern region. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to make sure they hear before we sign off? No, I just uh, want to encourage anyone listening to uh, join join us in this crusade to have better conversations. I always say that I'm a better conversation activist, and you can be one too. Uh, all you have to do is start talking, ask people questions, be curious. Be curious how people are the way they are, and you'll get a, get a lot out of it. I love it. Be curious, conversation starters. Thanks, Chris. All right. Thank you, Emmy. All right. What did you learn? Did you enjoy the conversation? I so enjoyed talking to Chris Muntz and really building that relationship. He brings so much to the table, and I'm really thankful that we had this opportunity to unpack everything he learned at Southern Region ACDA, but also just to inspire continual conversation. So if you're looking to join conversations, both Chris and I have Patreon pages, patreon.com slash the Coralosophy podcast and slash music ed matters podcast. All of these things help us keep this platform alive and going. As we mentioned in the show, so we record these in our spare rooms and we are talking to a computer and we don't know what you are getting out of this. So it really means a ton when you reach out and let us know, yes, we like this. Yes, we want more of this. Yes, we're listening. And we really appreciate all that you do. So you can support us over at Patreon or you can shoot us messages. You can find me at emilybirch.org slash contact or follow me on the social. Um, both the podcast and myself have social media pages, Music Ed Matters Podcast and Dr. Emmy B on the Insta. Anyway, I think that's enough, but I know that you know, you matter. We all know that music matters, especially having conversations. And I'll see you next time on the Music and Matters podcast. Thanks for listening, Choralosophy folks.